Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. It's really great to be here. I'm just going to do some introductions and make some opening provocations, and then we will hand it over to our, our esteemed panel. Uh, my name is Marianne Franklin, Mariana as in Marianne of Day, faithful Franklin as in Aretha. So I'm Professor of Global Media and Politics, and I'm currently Chair of Media, Cultural Industries and Society at the University of Groningen. I was previously at Goldsmiths in London. Um, and I'm moderating this panel. And to my right, your left, I have uh, Dr. Eleanor Kami, who is Senior Lecturer in Data Politics and Social Justice at the Department of Sociology and Criminology in the New School, I believe, of Policy and Global Affairs, uh, City University, London. And to my left is David Duenas Sid, who's the Marie Curie uh, Fellow at Gdansk University of Technology and is currently working as an associate professor, uh, researcher at the University of Tartu in Estonia. I also president of the thematic group on digital sociology at the International Sociology Association, general chair at the eVote ID conference, and program chair of the annual international conference on digital government research. Uh, welcome. And to my far right, uh, <laughs> your far left, take it as you like, <laughs> Julia Bola, who's senior researcher Politics of Digitalization from the DZB at the Berlin Social Science Center, also Senior Associate Researcher at the Center for Digitalization, Democracy and Innovation in Brussels, Co-Chair of the Communication Policy and Technology Section, so I see a lot of Julia in my email, <laughs> uh, uh, at the International Association for Media and Communication Research, which is what everybody knows as IMCR, and Academic Editor, of course, for the Internet Policy Review. So these are our panelists. I'm really looking forward to a very interdisciplinary and hopefully uh, spicy discussion. Our plan is, um, after I've made a few uh, opening remarks, because it's the only chance I'm going to get, I'll take two more minutes, um, we'll open up to the panel. I'll be about half an hour, and at which point uh, there'll be time for about 10, 15 minutes from you, the audience, and then we're going to keep an eye on the bar so we won't keep you here too long. Um, anyway, we're five years, ten years, we're five years plus, to use UN terminology, for the Internet Policy Review. Uh, and we're going to be looking more or less around the notion of trust, distrust, whatever that is, and how it might or might not relate to digital sovereignty, whatever that is, in light of three points. We have default proprietary power of what we call big tech. I don't need to spell that out. We have the return, it seems, of the rule of law and institutions of nation states and intergovernmental organizations, otherwise called regulators. And we also have a whole host of activities presumed, enacted, self-identified and funded of civil society organizations who try to hold both those two large, important power holders to account in all areas of internet policy making. But actually, um, <clears throat> I have under instructions for us not to be too gloomy. Nonetheless, uh, it's five years since we last got together, and I was lucky enough to be here for the five-year birthday party. But what a five years it has been. And I'm sure I'm not the only one to want to think back over the last five years. Uh, whether there are reasons to be cheerful, if I may cite the late, great Ian Jury, despite some more gloomy prognoses about the increasing democratic deficit, of the internet-dependent world's dependence, increasing dependence, again, that word, on digital networks to do anything at all. So one could argue in the last five years that's come home. Why? Because what have we seen, and I'm just selecting, ongoing wars and militarized conflict, ongoing in Syria, ongoing militarized conflict in the occupied territories, ongoing. New wars right now at the doorstep of Europe, European Union, in Ukraine. The global pandemic, which changed arguably everything, but also saw a boom in being online, legitimately. We no longer have to go into the office. The arrival of online conferencing in a way we've never experienced. But the huge inroads that edtech, educational technology, has made at all levels of education. <clears throat> the two mosque massacres in New Zealand, which is, of course, my uh, homeland, are perpetrated by one gunman with one webcam, two automatic rifles, went global live on Facebook. And that kind of brought to light the whole content moderation, uh, regulation, platform responsibility 
uh, to the public eye. And we're still seeing the aftermath of that. New regulatory tools, Digital Services Act, Copyright Directive, following on from the GDPR, the EU, and of course, a whole of national, nation state based initiatives to try and protect minors online, such as the infamous, shall we say, Eleanor, online safety bill in the UK. The rise of Chinese made components, Huawei, and microprocessors that keep the internet and our devices running, alongside increasingly embedded monopolies by singular millionaires that own and control the transmission pathways. And here I'm thinking of Elon Musk's Starlink dominance. And finally, the rise, the rise, the rise, the rise, and the rise of all things AI, making moot the question of whether the human part of human rights for the online environment, to cite an earlier articulation from over a decade ago, human rights online exist just as human rights exist offline, whether that human part is being replaced by digital actors. And who are they? Or what are they? So we're going to broach these ideas and we're going to use two kind of tricky terms, uh, trust and sovereignty. Very broad, very opaque, very meta level. But we're going to try and pin them down conceptually in the basis of my three experts' research uh, and their thinking and with your help. Um, we're going to problematize them, hopefully shake us up, open up a few back boxes, have a discussion and go start drinking to prepare ourselves for this amazing set of lectures we're going to have later in the evening. So, opening statements from our three panelists, and then I will go from there. We have a little plan, but obviously we're going to go with the flow. So I'm going to switch from my very old tablet to even older, uh, ink on dead wood. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to go in order of alphabetical order. So first of all, Eleanor Kami then David, and then Yulia. They're going to make short opening statements and then we'll proceed accordingly. So, Eleanor. Can you hear me? Oh, okay, great. So it's a bit weird because it's a very fluffy thing in front of my face. Um, hi, everyone. So for those of you who don't know me, um, we were asked to do these kind of very short interventions. So um, I decided to talk a bit about kind of the things that I learned and I think are really important and kind of relate them to the internet policy review. And what I really like is the word review, because for me and my work, that was always really important. So I think in the last decade, what I was basically doing is trying to understand what's happening behind those screens. So kind of looking into the politics of the ad tech industry, um, but also specifically unpacking all of the stuff around web cookies uh, and digital consent and kind of showing that we can talk about this and we should talk about this from media and communication and sociology points of view. Because what I realize is that computer scientists, and I think a lot of us see that in a lot of the news that we see and a lot of the research that we conduct, whether it's policy or whatever, that there is this kind of computer science and the tech industry's narratives that are controlling and kind of dominating how we understand, but also how we engage with these technologies. So that kind of relates to the other aspect of my work, which is data literacies, which is, um, as Frederick uh, mentioned before, I edited a special uh, issue around that uh, for the Internet Policy Review. And I think that these are really important because I think as scholars and as journalists, as practitioners, it's really important for us to review the concepts and the narratives that were being fed by the tech industries and start thinking of different narratives. So in my work, it's not only about how we can examine that, but also importantly, how we can reimagine and create different narratives and counter these kind of dominant narratives. And I think, again, that it's it's so hard for us to imagine that, that, and I see that in my work when we're interviewing, for example, citizens of how, you know, how they engage with technologies, but also with NGO practitioners so, for example, in my latest work, I asked them, you know, if you had all of the resources that you can, how would how would things look like? And that was a really hard question for them because it was really hard for them to imagine a different world, right? A world without Google, a world without Microsoft. And I think that is a trap for us because if we can't kind of verbalize or think about or create these kind of new terms, then it's really hard from, for us to, to break through. So, short, concise. Um, Thanks, Eleanor. That's very helpful. Okay, turning now to David's opening statement. Ah, no, you have your own. You have your own. Okay, sorry. <laughs> just checking, just do a sound check. We're okay? We're good? Yeah, okay. David, do yeah. you have a mic? 
Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Okay, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, yeah, yeah, thank you so much for the introduction and for the opening statement. Um, in my case, I mean, by training, I'm a sociologist and I'm working generally with technology, with technology, public administration, and so on. And then somehow, quite often when I'm working with technology, I'm, I'm coming across different perspectives or different ways of understanding and looking at the same thing that I'm looking. For example, I'm researching on internet voting. And I'm organizing one conference on internet voting, and there are lots of cryptographers that they are coming. And they are always using the concept of trust, which is one of the opening concepts that we are having here. And their understanding of trust is very different from the one that I have. When they talk about trust, cryptographers, they talk about security, they talk about complexity, they talk about making this thing invulnerable, and so on and so on. And for me as a sociologist, this is not necessarily what is bringing trust into a particular technological setup. So for me, it's more connected with which use we are making of it, uh, which are the discourses around the technology itself and so on. And therefore, I became interested in making research on that. And I, I, took, uh, I, I used an idea which is not particularly original because it was already written a few years ago, that trust and distrust, they are not symmetrically opposite concepts. So that trust and distrust, they are different concepts, that they have different meanings by themselves and that we can approach them differently and in parallel if we want to get an overall picture of why do people trust certain technology. And therefore, I'm trying to implement that on internet voting, as, as we will see later. But this is my, my first idea. As I said, it's not original. It was already uh, written before. But still, there have been uh, there is uh, an open avenue for researching in this topic and for implementing this particular idea in different technological setups. Some of them, for example, artificial intelligence or things that you were mentioning before. And in my case, I'm doing that on internet voting. Okay, so keeping these kinds of... Uh throbbing terms in our heads. Turning to Yulia for your opening statement and then we'll proceed to unpack a little bit. Thank you. I, I also have one of these fluffy little mics. They're cute. Um, so uh, I'm a, um, by training a communication scholar and I over the last years I worked a lot on the history and the changing role of states in communication governance uh, and uh, one of the things I, I you cannot work on if you, like, you cannot miss if you work on this is actually the discourse of digital sovereignty which has become very prominent over the last um, decade. Um, and so I was thinking how to kind of relate the, the topic of this panel, which is uh, like looking back these last 10, five years, and also thinking about the notion of trust to my research. Um, and I came up that actually it's interesting to look at digital sovereignty from a perspective of trust, because in some way you can say that the reasons we are talking about digital sovereignty here in Europe um, uh, at the moment, uh, and and why we we started talking about is maybe that they, you can say that on the one hand we lost trust, and on the other side we gained trust. Uh, and this I mean is we lost trust when we look at external um, sovereignty. So when you look at the relation between, for example, the state and external powers, we clearly over the last ten, five, ten years we lost trust. So we lost trust in in the kind of liberal governance model that we had for the internet. We lost trust in the idea of an open, free internet that kind of would self-regulate itself. We lost trust in, in private actors that they can also would self-regulate and that they would act in the best interest of their users and consumers. And we clearly also lost trust in the US government, government who is kind of behind this I ideology, if you want. So, so we lost trust. And that's why we kind of wanted to um, determine or strengthen our self-determination that way. But on the other hand, you can say that we also gained trust as citizens in Europe. We gain trust when we look at internal sovereignty, so the, the relationship between the state or Europe as a union of states and its citizens, because we now actually trust our governments to protect our rights in the online space. And this is really when you look at like a long time ago, because at the beginning, of, we all remember, we see the creation of independence and so on, kind of governments were supposed to stay outside of the digital space. And now, actually, nowadays, we expect them to go in and regulate and act in our best interests and defend our interests vis-a-vis -vis these other external powers like companies and other governments. Also, when we look at what we just had, disinformation, for example, or whatever is going on in the online public sphere, we now actually expect our governments and we trust them to do this in our best interests, at least in Europe, we do this. And of course, it doesn't mean that they all, everything do everything right, uh, but they have our trust that they try to do this right. Uh, and I think this is the biggest change I can observe over the last 10 years. Thank you very much. So you can see how the word trust has been used in many ways already uh, as the opposite, but intention of distrust, trust as in we expect, we trust you will do this. This is a 
euphemism in British English for saying we expect you to do this, <laughs> or the genuine, yeah, they're all right, I can put my faith in them. We were talking a little bit about that in our preparations about whether uh, the term itself is adequate to what we're trying to capture. Uh, there was one of the ghastly Internet Governance Forum mottos. I feel it was a ghastly one called the Internet of Trust. Remember, guys? The Internet of Trust just sent, made my blood run cold. And I was thinking, why is that making my blood run cold? It's like someone saying to me, trust me. The minute someone says that to you, hmm. Anyway, so on this, I'm going to ask our two panelists, Julia, Julia, of course, you can jump in as you like. But um, Eleanor and David have been doing research specific around these issues. And I was talking about discourses and... Uh, the misuse or the co-optation of language in order to smooth over any problems to hide other things. So, um, David, would you like to tell us a little bit yeah. more about what you mean about trust, distrust and line yeah. of voting? Because that's a very specific uh, situation. Yeah, yeah, there are two things here that I would like to put on the table initially. For example, stemming uh, from one of the things that Julia was just, was just saying, that trust is growing and trust is decreasing at the same time. That would, but that would be, I know, it's, it's logically difficult to, to place that in a, in a, in a construct, but it makes absolutely sense when we, when we see the fact. So then, uh, it's interesting, for example, this approach that, that I'm trying to use in my research allows to put these two things. And I will put later one example based on, on one research I was doing in the Netherlands before. And understanding that if trust and distrust are two different concepts, they can coexist. Meaning that we can trust and distrust at the same time on the same thing based on different principles or, or one particular asset can or one particular thing can have a differential impact in different people and for some people that would bring them to trust the technology and for some others it would bring to distrust and that connects with my research topic uh, i'm researching elections and elections are a really particular part of public administration management i mean you are you can create an artificial intelligence system and if the day one this system is not working okay we will repair it and it will work on day two so the trust is not lost immediately in case it's not, it's not practically working. But on electoral management, if on the electoral day your system is not working, you, can, you don't have another chance. You need to postpone the elections and then the trust is over, not only in the system, but also in the, in the, in the overall uh, working of technology and democracy. And I was doing research on something that happened in the Netherlands in 2006 and 2007, in the Netherlands, you used to have, I'm saying you, even if you're not Dutch from what I understood, okay, but I'll, I'll take you are the representative <laughs> of the Netherlands then. <laughs> they used to have machines for, for, for casting votes. And there was one particular hacker that proved on the television that the machines were not trustworthy. He proved that during the electoral campaign, he went to the television, he said they are not trustworthy. There was a vivid debate with the builder of the computers. The computer builder said that yes, and he went to the television and made the computer play chess live. Of course, this is an absolutely trust breakdown. Um, for the government, I can imagine that they would be all panicking because they need to, to solve this issue to, to run the elections normally. And that provoked lots of, of issues. And of course, the system was withdrawn after a certain time and so on and so on. But interestingly, this hacker was bringing at the same time trust and distrust in the system. Was bringing distrust on the machines that they were using, pretending to bring trust on the overall functioning of democracy by saying we need to come back to pen and paper in this particular case. And it's interesting how these two concepts, somehow they can be, they can be merged together. Elections in the Netherlands are better now than they were before by withdrawing technology that was going to make the system more effective. But we can find different examples of, of the use of internet voting in which this particular thing brought more trust in the system, but I will probably comment that a bit uh, more a bit on that okay. later. Yeah, okay. Um, just before we move to Eleanor's um, example from research, just very briefly there, what exactly went wrong with the machine that meant it was not trustworthy? <laughs> just in so many words. There were two things. Uh, first of all, that this hacker was able to introduce a chip in one of the machines to prove that the machine was not working. So the machine itself was working, was performing the things as it was expected, but the, the, the organizational setup to protect the machines was not working. And this guy just went to the place where the machines were stored and said, I'm making a demo in a school. Could you borrow me one machine? Yes, of course. He took the machine, put a chip and proof on the TV, never give it back and proof on the TV that. And the second thing is that the machines, he demonstrated that uh, if you would have a microphone and you would be less than 10 meters far from the machine, there was one political party that had one, cap one letter that it was one of the normal 28 letters of the alphabet. So when people were pressing for this party, the machine was making 
a slightly different sound than with the rest of parties. So the secrecy of the vote would be corrupted if you have a microphone in less than 10 meters from that. Okay. But still, as in elections, these kind of concepts, they are very important. If the secrecy of the vote is corrupted, the system cannot be used anymore. Even if it's for some particular party that maybe it was never going to win the elections, but still that should have been protected. So there are many layers of complexity when we are talking about technology and about certain types of technology and on critical aspects like elections that can make the system shake for things that are really not not going to affect the overall result of elections, which is the general goal. When we are talking about elections, the, the goal is not that the elections are 100% representative of what people vote, but it's the fact that people will believe that they are 100% representative of what they vote. Okay. And that was making the, the things shake when it's not working like that. Okay, a very small thing, but big consequences. Thanks yep. for illustrating that. I just wanted us to be very clear about what it was exactly that was not working. Thanks. So, Eleanor, from your um, perspective, from the research you're being, you've been doing, what, what would you like to sort of add to our, our discussion here about whether trust is actually the right word? I think, again, I'm going to go back to kind of reviewing the things that we think we know and I'm going to talk a bit about the, the different projects I've done around data literacy. So, you know, we see a lot of research and a lot of questionnaires where you ask uh, people about, oh, are you okay uh, to trade your privacy or all of these kind of stuff for your data? What we discovered in our project that a lot of people actually don't know what is data. So when you actually ask them, you know, what do you think is data? They said, oh, my email, my name. They have no idea all the other kind of data points that, you know, companies are collecting on them or extracting from them. And another thing that they don't know is all of the organizations that are extracting that. So I think a lot of the time when we talked about trust, well, a lot of people don't even know how this kind of all of the data economy works. Another thing we asked people, you know, do you like personalization? So a lot of people said, yeah, you know, more than 90%. But then when we asked them, do you like to, you know, how, how do you think about uh, companies tracking you over time? And 95% and more said that they don't like that. The fact that they don't connect the personalization to tracking over time just shows, you know, a lot of these kind of misconceptions that we think, oh, you know, we talk about data. So obviously people know about data. We talk about all of these companies and ad tech companies, which we discovered every day, new ones that are extracting our data. They didn't even know when we asked them organizations that, have their data. They didn't even think about even governments and things like that. So again, kind of going back to reviewing the things that we take for granted, it's not only concepts, it's what do people actually know? And I'm not talking about people who are more tech savvy or, you know, who read a, a lot about this. We talked with, you know, people who come from a uh, lower income and kind of uh, a lesser kind of uh, education attainment. And I think that here context is really important because a lot of the time we make assumption about, you know, people, people go, you know, what they're doing, their research, they usually um, interview students, it's easier, right? So, you know, a lot of the kind of the participants that we would have is, is students, or people that are easier to access a lot of the time, maybe through social media, a lot of people are actually still not still do not have internet, a lot of people still do not have social media. And so I really want to say that a lot of this trust and distrust, a lot of it has to be, a lot of it is related to what do people actually know? And, and then what can they actually do about these things, right? Because then when we ask, well, you know, I, I can't, you know, it's my work is related. I have to use Facebook or my family or my friends. So, you know, I, my, my relationship with trust is very complex because I feel like in order for us to have trust, I need to understand what I'm doing, right? In an election, mm -hmm. I sort of know what I'm doing. I'm voting for somebody to do this and that, right? But if I'm pressing consent, the majority of people don't know what that means. And whenever I show my students, you know, what's happening in the back end uh, of their screens, they're completely shocked. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, when they're seeing hundreds of cookies sent to their devices, whether it's, you know, their phones or, or computers. And obviously there was, you know, different kind of, uh, uh, PR and different kind of lobbying, which I show in my work of the different tech industries to hide that from us, right? Because actually at the beginning, the, the default setting was, you know, they saw maybe we actually show them what's happening behind the screen. And then the advertising industry said, no, it's going to confuse them. All of these cookies, it's, it's, it's too much. Let's do all of these pristine, you know, looking websites where you can't really see what's happening in the back end. So for me, trust is very complex. It's about, you know, a lot of deception that's going on. And kind of luring people to sit to, to press these buttons that basically they don't know what they mean. 
And, you know, they're basically worthless because they're not really doing what they're supposed to do. So I think we need to ask ourselves, you know, trust who does it work for, right? When mm -hmm. we're talking about when Facebook tells us should trust us or Google, you know, should trust us, you know, who does it serve? Who, who does these kind of platform work for? Yeah, so we actually got two contrasting here. We've got by accident, totally just incompetence, mm -hmm. you could argue, lack of due diligence, all the rest of it, and by design. Uh, perhaps we need to think about as an audience synonyms for trust. No, uh, also in your own language, are we talking here about faith? Are we not talking about powerful power holders saying have faith, have faith? There's a sort of deification in a sense going on, uh, whether by accident or by design. So with that in mind, hopefully you can come back um, in the audience, uh, uh, feedback and interaction. So we've, we've sort of hopefully broken it open a little bit uh, based on research. I'm going to shift a little bit to the other sort of theme, which is this theme about sovereignty, uh, because uh, it is connected in some way or other. Uh, sovereign means to have power over something, whatever that something might be within a confined area. I come from a part of the world called Aotearoa, New Zealand. For us, sovereignty is shared. Not everybody agrees. <laughs> But it is by a treaty 150 odd years ago, supposedly shared ownership and control of natural resources and now increasingly through a digital data sovereignty movement, supposedly shared control. So sovereignty here has one loading, but I know from Yulia, from your research, the issue around sovereignty, and that's another buzzword we're seeing in, uh, you know, European and international and multi-stakeholder settings. Sovereignty, let's get back our sovereignty and somehow all these issues will be resolved. So I'd like, Yulia, from the basis of your research, uh, where do you think this whole sovereignty thing, or was it just another discourse game, another form of hocus pocus? <laughs> what would you say? Um, no, actually, I would, um, I was just thinking, listening to Eleanor, I, I would like to pick up from there because yeah. what Eleanor is speaking of is more like this would be what we now are in the debate on digital sovereignty in, in Europe would probably referred to as individual sovereignty, so the, 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 the right of the individual user to understand what is going on and to have a say in it and to act and to make a choice, right? Um, and that also means the competence to understand what is going on. So this would be kind of what we would call individual digital sovereignty. Um, and what also is, is, is the aim, especially here in Germany, a lot of the, the government strategy goes into kind of increasing this individual digital sovereignty. And then there's a completely different layer in the debate, which is not about individual sovereignty, but it's about collective sovereignty and how we can assure as a state, as a union of state, uh, as particular groups. Uh, you, you just mentioned in New Zealand, there's, of course, there's also this six, um, uh, in Australia as well. So New Zealand from Australia? New, New Zealand. Zealand, sorry. And uh, there is this, anyway, in, in different countries, there is this debate about indigenous digital sovereignty as yeah. well, this idea of that, that they need to have their own kind of way to, to assure their, their self-determination in the digital space. So there are different kind of layers to the debate of digital sovereignty. Um, and I, 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 in my research, I kind of tried to, to trace them also historically, how they developed and where they come from and what are the different actors behind it, the different reasoning behind. And, and what I look in particular is, of course, the, the debate how it's going on in Europe. And, and I think what is extremely interesting here is that it has, it initially was a concept which was kind of referring to the, when used by European policymaker to the, the, the Europe as an internal digital market. So it was also used as a policy concept to defend within Europe and vis-a-vis -vis European citizens what the European Commission was doing in terms of digital strategy. So kind of to say we, we need this different kind of policy instruments because we need to defend our digital sovereignty and the digital sovereignty of our of, of you as European citizens. So this was kind of a mix between this collective digital sovereignty and the individual one. And also, like, trust me as a state or trust us as a union of state to actually have faith that we, 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 um, kind of help you to gain this kind of sort of digital sovereignty and to be able to make choices individual and so on. And what we saw with the last years, and I think the pandemic has a lot to do with it, that they actually, Europe started to use this concept as an externally oriented policy concept. And it's not longer only oriented to European citizens and companies and so on but it is more becoming as a, a key policy on the to kind of position Europe globally, uh, especially in the kind of competition between the US and China. Uh, so Europe is trying to kind of say, okay, we have this, this vision of a digital order, which is different from the US liberal one and different from the restrictive authoritarian Chinese one. 
We want to have this third way, European way of a digital transformation. And digital sovereignty is our way and our means to get there, basically. So it's becoming a geopolitical term rather than a, a kind of internal policy concept. And I think this is uh, very interesting because with this aspect, we completely lose this individual um, dimension as well, because that doesn't make sense in the geopolitical um, debate around digital sovereignty then. I think that's really, really important what Julia is bringing up. And I think, David, from your work as well, and Eleanor from your other work with, uh, with surveillance uh, devices, is that sovereignty has many loadings in different contexts. So uh, uh, community sovereignty, or let's think about what we mean by sovereignty, when it's impacted by ownership and control or lack of ownership and control. What if your machines are owned by a large multinational? Uh, what if your key strategic infrastructure for your mobile mass is owned by another great power? What if the own, your own government, as uh, many people found out in 2013 after Snowden and still going on, is actually spying uh, extra, extra judicially on its own citizens or hounding others? So where does sovereignty fit into this? I mean, what are we actually talking about? I think I'd just like to ask the panel to say, what do we actually, what do we, what do you, th what do you mean from your research when you think about sovereignty? If it's even relevant, if it's not, you can say, no, I'm passing and giving it to someone else. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in my case, for example, I mean, there are different ways of approaching the, the, the logic of sovereignty, for example, depending on who, to whom is this particular type of technology providing a solution. I mean, I was, uh, I came back from Australia two weeks ago where I was conducting some research because there in Australia, they used to have also an internet voting system that it was initial, initially brought to the public scene by people who were visually impaired. Because in Australia, they have some interesting phone voting system in which people who have problems with vision, either they go by hand with someone to vote, so then they need to trust a person who is next to them that, that they are voting for party B or A or whatever, or they have a system that they call to one telephone number, and then they get a number, uh, an identification number to, to keep the secrecy of their identity. Then they call to another number, they provide this number, they say what they vote, and so on. So they always need to rely on somebody else. But using internet voting, for example, they could be individually sovereign, and they could exercise the right to vote as normal citizens, or citizens which are not visually impaired, sorry. Um, and then there is one dimension that it's connected with that. I mean, to whom the technology is providing uh, a service and technology can help to gain uh, individual sovereignty. But at the same time, cryptographers in Australia, they were quite against the use of internet voting for the possibility of, of having some kind of security breaches that could compromise the overall quality or integrity of the elections. So we were facing there some kind of, of clash between individual and collective sovereignty on, one partic on this particular case. And there's another case that we were commenting before where this thing can come to the table, that in this case we're talking between the individual and the collective. But for example, the case of Ukraine, that, that this 2024, they are going to have elections. And they are facing, I mean, at stake is the sort of democratic sovereignty of the country. They need to organize elections. They were at some moment considering the option of introducing some internet voting system to ensure that they can organize elections. But that could put different questions on one hand. If you need to do elections on paper, your security, security of voters could be compromised. If you do elections online, there will be lots of discussions about the security of the, of the technological system. And then there is an overall question of the sovereignty of the state who is organizing the elections on whether to use technology to provide the service or not. So in my case, for example, I'm, I'm approaching the concept of sovereignty in a really pragmatic way because it helps to, to understand or to respond to some questions. But of course, I'm not getting so much deep on the, on the analysis of the of the particular definition of the concept of probably you are doing and probably you are doing also. So good. I mean, so in terms of context, sovereignty implied some sort of prerogative. You yeah. have the prerogative mm -hmm. to, as, to vote privately mm -hmm. in the way mm -hmm. you wish without interference mm -hmm. or fear of um, leaks or intervention. So that's a kind of very personalized notion, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And then we have this much more geopolitical one. If we bring it down to sort of another cultural geopolitical militarized conflict situation. Eleanor, is this a chance perhaps to talk about a little bit about your NSO uh, discoveries? Um, yeah, so uh, in my latest work with uh, Dan Putlia, uh we basically analyzed the legitimation kind of, of surveillance by NSO. So we kind of analyze how they express themselves in different media. And I think one of the things, you know, we think about sovereignty, but I think context is so important, like you just said, mm -hmm. because NSO, what a lot of people don't know maybe, 
uh, is that it depends on the Israeli defense ministry because it's an export of kind of, uh, uh, kind of cyber uh, weapon. Uh, it depends on it. And what that means is that the way that they express themselves in the Israeli media is very different than the way that they express themselves in other types of media. So we analyzed uh, how they express themselves. And first of all, they mainly interview in Israeli media up until very recently, and I'm going to say why the, the kind of the public opinion has changed about NSO, up until recently, they were quite celebrated. So it's not a secret um, uh, that Israel is quite a militarized uh, uh, country, but um, one of the things that kind of was celebrated is, you know, that one of their CEO, which is not their CEO anymore, Shalev Julio, he was elected as, you know, the most uh, influential people, you know, when they, they do like the yearly kind of 100 most influential people, all of these things, they were celebrated. They were collaborating with different kind of newspapers to talk about their success as a cyber company. Uh, they always denied, you know, different kind of uh, things that they've done across because, you know, they're doing it for the country and the way that they tailored it. So they had different kind of tailoring of their messages to the Israeli audience. You know, we're doing it for the security of people. We're doing it because we're Zionists, you know, that we want to kind of help and kind of bring different kind of things to the Israeli uh, society. It was very much tailored to the Israeli audience because as every company, you know, they have different kind of stakeholders that they need to please, right? Their users, their investors, mainly the Israeli politicians, uh, things like that. Now, so up until quite recently, they were quite celebrated in the Israeli public. Uh, there's very little kind of critical points of view about technology in the Israeli mainstream media. Um, but the thing that kind of changed things is that recently we discovered there was an expose that the Israeli police was using Pegasus, which is an, one of NSO's uh, technologies, to spy on activists. And that's when people were like, oh, wait, you're spying on us? That's not okay. Now we don't really like you. And that's when, you know, NSO started. Of course, they were also uh, put in a, a blacklist in the, in the U.S. Uh, kind of uh, uh, blacklisting of the different technologies they get, people can use. But I think, again, context is really important. And a lot of the time when we talk about surveillance, when we're talking about te tech industry, we're kind of only talking about the big companies like the U.S. or maybe Europe. Uh, and we're forgetting that there are other types of companies and other types of countries where definitely trust in the government or trust in these kind of things is very disputed for whoever is following what's happening in Israel in the past few months. Uh, the trust, not that there was ever such a big trust, but now it's even worse. There's people demonstrating against the government. So it's never just technology, right? It's always a mixture of the context of cultural context. Uh, sociological, historical, economical. So all of these things matter. And it's really important not to make generalizations, but also when we're talking about these technologies to understand that they answer to different kinds of stakeholders and how they speak to these stakeholders differently in order to gain their trust. Okay, thanks. I think this allows me to ask Yulia the sort of golden question about the EU's positioning of itself as the white knight. If I may use a fairy tale reference. Do you all know what I mean by white knight? On the white horse to come and rescue the princess from the tower. Before I do that, though, NSO for the record, and the recording stands for NSO, the company. It's actually the, the initial of the, the founders of the company. Okay, right. Just, just so, so that just the so people who are. First name, yeah. the letter of the name. NSO, okay, good. Oh, so, Yuli, where, where do you think, uh, in terms of this whole kind of positing of EU ideas about trust? trustworthy technology, trustworthy regulation, better, better than the Americans, better than the Chinese for sure, better than everywhere. We've got the GDPR, we've got everything now. Let's roll it out. What do you say to that based on your, um, you know, we're, we're amongst friends here, so. Um, well, I think it's, um, it's, it's, I, 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 Maybe I pick up the notion of, of context. It really depends on where the EU is communicating it, in, in which way, and uh, uh, who they, they kind of include in, in this, this vision of a digital transformation led by European values, democratic values, a human-centered kind of digital transformation, right? So if they use it within the EU, I think also there are different, many different contexts. We have so many different countries, and there are countries where citizens probably do not trust their governments as much as we do here in Germany or in other countries, right? So there's already many different kind of contexts within Europe 
But now that they start to kind of export this idea of me being kind of the standard setting or like institution or even like the EU putting forward this vision and trying also to transport them to different parts of the world. And that's what they're really doing. They have these different strategies as well to really kind of export this idea of the digital transformation, especially to the global south. I think there they need, Europe needs to be very careful what it does and how it communicates it. Because it might not sit so well, in, especially in many of the African countries with a colonial past. If Europe comes and thinks we have the better idea and we have this vision and we bring civilization and, and human values to you, I think this is a kind of a very art historical myth from the EU. And I'm not sure if they really thought about this so much um, uh, and what they are doing. So this is kind of my thing. So I think it really depends on 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 from which perspective you're looking at this kind of discourse of the EU. It's also very arguably from, certainly from the Australian examples, we're not just talking about people with disabilities, also um, ethnicity, a religious persuasion, gender, sexuality, class, caste. These are all really important granular dimensions that I think tend to be missing when we talk about these big terms. So, uh, yeah, um, point taken, the EU... Uh, and its European values also sends me shivering a little bit, child of a settler society that I am. Um, so with that, I'm going to just segue now to the audience. I'd love to hear what you have to say. We all would. Uh, and then we'll have a little bit of uh, interaction in the audience. And then I'm just going to, uh, Frederic, I've got my eye on about five o'clock-ish to, is that all right with you, whatever. And then uh, I will allow our panellists to have their final word with an outro. So panellists, get ready. Anyone from the audience would like to uh, make a comment, please be brief. This is not your PhD defense. <laughs> um, okay. If, if I can be so facetious. I'm sorry, having done one myself long ago. One at the back. Just your name, uh, just so we know who you are. One at the front. Anybody else? Good. We'll start at the back there. Sorry. Sure. Uh, Maya, thank you all. Um, so when I think about your ambition to achieve digital sovereignty, one thing that comes to mind, a key pillar of that is the sort of new interventionist industrial policy. Think of something like the subsidies for Intel. Think about the important project of community European interest for microelectronics. Think about what used to be the European Sovereignty Fund, now STEP. And I think what's interesting about this, against the backdrop of the team of this panel, is that it involves a sort of two level trust game. On the one hand, the state needs to trust the companies that will actually do what they were told to pledge for the money. Yes. And on the other hand, um, we as citizens need to trust the governments that they actually will enforce conditionality if, if, the, if the companies don't do what they said they would do. So my question, do you have trust or do you have faith in the European Union that in trying to achieve digital sovereignty, it will not also sort of set up a massive program of public wealth? Um, okay, very good question. I'll let Yuli ask, and um, um, David and Anna will chime in. Yuli, do you have a responsibility to that challenge? I, I think it's a tough one. I mean, uh, do I personally trust? I mean, it's, I think what we need, to, what I see also when analyzing all this, and, and you know this as much as I know, Timo, because we both analyze European discourses on digital sovereignty, and what you can see is that they become increasingly normative, well, like loaded, like all this idea of digital sovereignty is there to actually defend our European and democratic values. But what you can see on the policy level and on what is actually happening it's a lot of economic and security policies. So it's actually, they kind of add this normative dimension to justify what they're doing, even to themselves, I feel, about what they're actually doing when you look at the, 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 the really like the governance arrangement that come out of it. It's mostly security policy and economic, mostly economic policy, but also a bit of security. So if that's an answer, I, I, I think we need to be very careful with this normative dimension of this discourse and not just buy into it. Um, yes, and I think even... Even when I speak to European policymakers about it, they're not entirely aware, or at least they do not like to admit to this, um, that there is this kind of normative dimension to it, which is kind of set on top of it, but it doesn't really correspond to what they're doing. Because trust itself is a normative uh, term. So good, thank you. Uh, next intervention, we have you at the front. This sorry about you at the front, yeah, but you give us an, an in arm behind. Yeah. Uh, I'm Florian. I had, a, I had a brief comment about kind of a bit involved in kind of uh, efforts to improve the Cyber Responsibility Act. Mm -hmm. And kind of this whole thing showed me a little bit that maybe this whole, like the European Legislative Initiative to increase sovereignty, also improve the digital space, maybe that we talked about, is 
kind of a bit of a mess and sometimes I have the impression that some people don't really care what they actually do as long as they do something. So that's maybe quantity over quality. <laughs> and so I wanted to ask if what's your take on this if you have had like similar experiences. So, so Florian, you're sort of suggesting, I think it's a very provocative and interesting one, that all this policy making and all these regulations and directors are just basically keeping busy. And meanwhile, no, the world's on fire. For example, if you hear, of course, that's not official, yeah. confirmed, but uh, that, well, okay, the, this one council presidency ends and the new one begins or whatever, yeah. and then, yeah, you have like, to have this finished before or by the end of the quarter or something, then you're like, yeah, but is that really the goal, you know? <laughs> well, that's a sort of systemic, almost sort of cultural issue. Yeah, like shouldn't there be like some other quality metric that yeah. you, you want to achieve, let's say? Who, who is the EU accountable to in its policy quality? Can we hold on to that thought because I think we can return to the panel. I'm just, uh, the next, and then I'll have you on the list. Who's there? Yeah, after you. My name is Risa, and I have a question to all, but it comes from a remark that Julia made saying that we, we gained trust in our countries and the EU to defend our rights. And I want to challenge that a little bit, saying like, two, um, because I had a conversation, uh, we had one project about um, platform uh, boards, uh, thinking about how actually uh, uh, platforms could install boards and that would meet some kind of your regulation or laws uh, of states. And a person close to the government who I presented this idea was like, this is never going to happen because of foreign policy. We would never uh, bring this uh, to the American president uh, as a European approach, and it will never come through because it will just destroy, uh, destroy too many uh, U.S. armaments, and we will never be able to do that. So do we trust in the EU to actually defend our rights, even if it's against the interests of allies? Okay. Ooh. Even the allies yeah. question, Mark. Yes. So now we're getting to the real kind of nitty gritty here. I'm going to, uh, you know, is it even possible to counter the power, the de facto ownership and control of everything we do by non-European companies, basically, without wanting to sort of uh, get too specific because we can use our imagination. Julia, it was great to you. Would you like to respond? And then uh, Eleanor nodded. Not... Do we uh, Can we trust? Can or we do trust? We trust? Yeah. Can we trust, right? Yeah, okay. And uh, and I'm not saying that we can trust, but we kind of expect them to act in our interests. And that is what has changed, right? Because we didn't 20 years ago. Okay. We actually expected them to stay out of it because we thought we just self-regulate everything and we'll be fine. And that turned out to be a myth. Yeah. Okay. Any responses from um, David? Or yeah, I would, I, I would add also another maybe provocative question. I mean, I understand that can we trust them? But also the other question is, is there any alternative than trusting them? I mean, what is the alternative? Leave it on the hands of the external companies that you are saying that we need to be protected from. I mean, if it's not European Union, the one who is trying to make this step, there is hardly anyone who has the capacity at least to try. Then we can discuss if they are successful or not, or if, if we are going on the right direction, if it's better to follow one or another path. But sadly, I think there is no alternative than at least giving the chance to let them try. Okay, and then we, I think, for Elena, just very briefly, your response to this? And, um, I mean, to me, the question would be what can actually citizens can do, what can people do? Mm -hmm. And I think that whilst the GDPR was a good starting point, uh, so far, it, I don't think it's successful. A lot of people have shown that actually citizens, first of all, don't know what are their rights, don't know how to do it. We're seeing much scrims. How many years has been going against Facebook? Almost five years. So the instruments that we are given against these big technology companies are not good. They're not working. So, you know, I think that when we're thinking about policy and all of this discussion, that's great. But when it's actually not working, and now we can find Facebook and Google until tomorrow and give them a million here, a million there, they make it in an hour. So I think that we need to, sh again, review how we're doing policy. It's not working, and we need to think about it in a different way. Okay, thank you, Eleanor. We have Uta here. Stu, have a... Yeah. So for listening to you, I find that quite uh, instructive. And I'm thinking, so maybe for um, sovereign, for a um, story about sovereignty to be successful, it always involves to be successful in bothering if they do something to be sovereign about. And if that is, if that is the case, and I find it quite curious that we can absorb Julia from what you were saying, that you was trying to sort of uh, export or be successful in um, defending 
digital sovereignty worldwide, uh, uh, granting granting every country the the, the right or the, the yeah granting granting every country the right to be self sovereign and to support their efforts towards those ends. How does that unite with then filling this idea of sovereignty on a very practical internet policy level with open standards, interoperability, mm-hmm. interconnectedness, and and ideas that in fact um, can as well be associated with lack of sovereignty. I find that so um, puzzling, but I'd be interested in your understanding how this um, relates or how this can be <laughs> really your your take on it. So it's sovereignty is zero sum game. I was just wondering before we get to that response, can we just have one more question, if that's okay, just so we can. Yeah, uh, it fits perfectly. Okay, I good. Wanted, so I'm Tobias Mars now. I wanted to contact connect to sovereignty on the individual level, which was surely mentioned, but that sort of done, but especially, for example, the aim for data literacy, right? Mm-hmm. And you ended the public, the, the panel discussion, in saying that in these big birds, things like race, gender, disabilities, and so sort of kindness. And I want to connect with that because you probably all know that there's a lot of criticism of the idea of sovereignty that's spreading to the Shortly speaking, a bad name for hard ballots and disabilitating the survival of this power developed. So, on the individual level, I would like to ask you, is sovereignty even a good aim? <laughs> or is it a good aim? Or should, should we not ask or search for a better aim, like data literacy or individual citizens' possibilities that uh, could, could, could get to regulation or also? Look, I think those are two questions are nicely paired, and I think this gives us, because time is more or less up and the bar is waiting, uh, I'd like my panellists to respond to those questions in the form of your sort of closing remark as a response any way you wish. Uh, um, you know, we've troubled the terms of reference, and I think we've rightly troubled the terms of reference from a research point of view, also from an audit point of view. Nothing is self-evident. Uh, so on that count about whether sovereignty is the, the point, or if it's a zero-sum game, or if we're just playing with the same stuff that Empire played with 200 years ago, who knows. So to exit, I'm going to ask, let me think, uh, David, Yulia, and Eleanor, your closing remarks. Okay, well, in my case, I will bring it to the research on trans, which is the one that I'm not I'm skipping your question, but probably they are working more on sovereignty, so they can bring some answers on that. But I will bring it to, to the case of trust. And, and I would bring it to the, to the issue of, of knowledge, for example, that how trust is related with knowledge here. I mean, we were saying that, that trust, uh, it's a con- concept which is not easy to define. It's kind of a big word, like a big bag where we can put many things into. But for example, you were also mentioning the concept of faith, and I would bring also the concept of certainty, and related to the logic of knowledge. So meaning that the, the more knowledge we, we have, normally when we were thinking about trust in the past, the more knowledge we had, the more certainty we, we have that things are going to, to happen in the way we expect. One of the problems with the digitalization process is that our capacity to know and understand all the things that are happening in the process got reduced because it's impossible to get all the necessary knowledge to understand every possible step and implication of all the things that are occurring. Therefore, we have every time less certainties and probably we are getting closer to the logic of faith. And therefore, we have lots of questions like, okay, is the state able to perform this role? Is, is this solution able to even to to exist, can we control these things or not? Because it's, and we need to rely much more on trust. In a situation in which trust foundations are shaking constantly for lead, for lots of different, different reasons. And one last remark is that the way that many digital technologies found to, to people to trust or at least continue using it, it's through convenience. To making things very easy, to making things very nice, to making things very friendly, to making things in a way that you are not asking the necessary questions that you should have to see if you trust or not, but at least it's performing the activity in the way you expect. Therefore, the questions are erased by the, by the fact that it's performing correctly. And then we are giving data, we are accepting cookies, and we are using technologies that we would not use, maybe, if we would be aware of all what it entails. So... Every culture has its stories, its folk tales, its fairy tales about these figures that arrive and say, we promise you this, trust us, we will give you the gates to heaven uh, one way or the other, or to knowledge. So um, thank you very much, David. Uh, Yulia, you. you're, uh, and uh, then, yeah. First, yeah. I start with <laughs> okay, yeah. um, It's, um, yeah, but I was actually, 
I, I'll respond to you because I, I, I don't think there is an easy answer to this. And I don't think that the EU has thought this through. So, and I, I want to actually reply with an anecdote of, I was recently in a discussion with someone from the European External Action Service um, who was behind writing the, the European strategy and in creating digital infrastructures in the global south. And one of the lines in the, the strategy says, we want to do this kind of massive investment, private public investments from Europe in the global south to create digital infrastructures without creating new dependencies. And so I asked him, how are you going to do this? How can you kind of massively invest European money in digital infrastructure in the global south without creating new dependencies? And the person always responded by saying, like, because we will have choice, we will have, like, no, no, we're not talking about European dependency. Like, how will you do this without creating dependencies on the level of these countries? And the only answer I got was, like, well, it's their choice. They can be dependent on Europe, on the U.S., or on China, basically. <laughs> so I thought this was kind of telling about what is this idea of exporting this vision of a global, like, of a European version of the digital transformation to the global South. Thank you very much, Julia. Very, very pertinent. Eleanor, your final remark? So as somebody who's done a lot of work on media history, I think that it's important to remember that nothing is set in stone and everything is still negotiable. And I think that it's really important for us as a society to ask what kind of society we want and what will technology's role in it will be. So instead of, you know, thinking, for example, in the U.S. going against Google's in the kind of anti-competition, asking bigger questions, do we want these companies to have all our data and use it in the other way they want? We're seeing different kind of lawsuits around, you know, open AI and all these questions. The main question is, is it okay that they're doing what they're doing? And where are we as citizens? What is our power in this kind of market, in this kind of, you know, power dynamic? And I think that, again, nothing is set in stone. We still have power to have a say and create our own narratives into the way we want our societies to be. So, yeah. Thank you so much. So just as a final provocation, as a goodbye, and thank you very much for being here. Ask ourselves, who is this we? Is this the royal we? We, I, the sovereign Queen Victoria. I, Tsar Nicholas. That's the royal we. And that's the way we, actually as a plural here, tend to be using it. And that's the most problematic part to me about the discourse. So perhaps we could go on thinking about who is this we? And for whom are we speaking and on whose terms and do we have even the right to claim that we can speak for anyone else but ourselves and our immediates. They'll always question the we. That's the final. I hope that's uh, got us all thinking. Juice is flowing. Thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, chance. Thank you for a wonderful panel.